Matthew 14 Matthew 14 13 When Jesus heard it, John, who relates the same narrative, does not mention the reason why Jesus crossed over to the opposite bank. 6, 5, Mark and Luke differ somewhat from Matthew, for they describe the occasion of the journey to have been to give some repose to his disciples, after that they had returned from their embassy. But there is no contradiction here, for it is possible that he intended to withdraw his disciples into a desert place, in order that he might be more at leisure to train them for higher labors, and that, about the same time, an additional reason arose out of the death of John. Minds which were still feeble might have been terrified by the death of John, learning from the melancholy end of that eminent prophet what condition awaited them all. Certainly, as it was formerly related that, when John was imprisoned, Christ removed from Herod's territory, in order to avoid his fury for the time, so we may now infer that Christ, in order to keep his trembling disciples at a distance from the flame, withdrew into a desert place. How long the apostles were employed in their first embassy it is not in our power to determine, for the evangelists, as we have formerly remarked, either did not attend to dates, or did not observe them with great exactness. I think it highly probable that their commission to proclaim the kingdom of Christ was not confined to a single occasion, but that, as opportunities were offered, they either repeated their visit to some places, or went to others after a lapse of time. The words, they came together to him, I look upon as meaning that ever afterwards they were his constant attendants, as if the evangelist had said, that they did not leave their master so as to be individually and constantly employed in the ordinary office of teaching, but that, having discharged a temporary commission, they went back to school to make greater advances in learning. They followed him on foot out of the cities. Though Christ, who foresaw all things before they happened, was in no respect ignorant of what would take place, yet he wished, as a man, to forewarn his disciples, that the fact might testify the anxiety which he had about them. The vast crowd that had assembled shows how widely his fame was spread in every direction, and this left the Jews without excuse in depriving themselves, by their own carelessness, of the salvation which was offered to them, for even out of this great multitude, which was inflamed by a sudden zeal to follow Christ, it is evident from what is stated by John, 6 66, 1237, that not more than a very small number yielded a true and steady adherence to his doctrine. Matthew 14. 14. He was moved with compassion towards them. The other two evangelists, and particularly Mark, state more clearly the reason why this compassion, sympatha, was awakened in the mind of Christ. It was because he saw famishing souls whom the warmth of zeal had carried away from their homes and led into a desert place this scarcity of teaching indicated a wretched state of disorder, and accordingly Mark says that Jesus was moved with compassion towards them, because they were as sheep not having a shepherd not that, as to his divine nature, he looked upon them all as sheep, but that, as man, he judged according to the present aspect of the case. It was no small manifestation of piety that they left their own homes, and flocked in crowds to the prophet of God, though he purposely concealed himself from them. Besides, it ought to be remarked, that Christ was mindful of the character which he sustained, for he had been commanded to discharge the duties of a public teacher, and was therefore bound to look upon all the Jews, for the time being, as belonging to the flock of God and to the church, till they withdrew from it. So strongly was Christ moved by this feeling of compassion, that though, in common with his disciples, he was fatigued and almost worn out by uninterrupted toil, he did not spare himself. He had endeavored to obtain some relaxation, and that on his own account as well as for the sake of his disciples, but when urgent duty calls him to additional labor, he willingly lays aside that private consideration, and devotes himself to teaching the multitudes. Although he has now laid aside those feelings which belong to him as a mortal man, yet there is no reason to doubt that he looks down from heaven on poor sheep that have no shepherd, provided they ask relief of their wands. Mark says, that he began to teach them many things, that is, he spent a long time in preaching, that they might reap some lasting advantage. Luke says, 
that he spoke to them concerning the kingdom of God, which amounts to the same thing. Matthew makes no mention of anything but miracles, because they were of great importance in establishing Christ's reputation, but it may naturally be concluded that he did not leave out doctrine, which was a matter of the highest importance. Matthew 14. 15. When the evening was drawing on. The disciples had now lost their object, and they see that Christ is again absorbed in teaching, while the multitudes are so eager to receive instruction that they do not think of retiring. They therefore advise that for the sake of attending to their bodily wants, Christ should send them away into the neighboring villages. He had purposely delayed till now the miracle which he intended to perform, first, that his disciples might consider it more attentively, and might thus derive from it greater advantage, and next, that the very circumstance of the time might convince them that, though he does not prevent, and even does not immediately supply, the wants of his people, yet he never ceases to care for them, but has always at hand the assistance which he affords at the very time when it is required. 16. Give you to them something to eat. As a fuller exposition of this miracle will be found at, 18 the 6th chapter of John's Gospel, instead of troubling my readers with a repetition of what I have said, I would rather send them to that exposition, but rather than pass over this passage entirely, I shall offer a brief recapitulation. Hitherto Christ had bestowed his whole attention on feeding souls, but now he includes within his duties as a shepherd the care even of their bodies. And in this way he confirms his own saying, that to those who seek the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. All other things will be added, Matthew 6:33. We have no right, indeed, to expect that Christ will always follow this method of supplying the hungry and thirsty with food, but it is certain that he will never permit his own people to want the necessaries of life, but will stretch out his hand from heaven, whenever he shall see it to be necessary to relieve their necessities. Those who wish to have Christ for their provider, must first learn not to long for refined luxuries, but to be satisfied with barley bread. Christ commanded that the people should sit down in companies, and he did so, first, that by this arrangement of the ranks the miracle might be more manifest, secondly, that the number of the men might be more easily ascertained, and that, while they looked at each other, they might in their turn bear testimony to this heavenly favor. Thirdly, perceiving that his disciples were anxious, he intended to make trial of their obedience by giving them an injunction which at first sight appeared to be absurd, for, as no provisions were at hand, there was reason to wonder why Christ was making arrangements that resembled a feast. To the same purpose is what follows, that he gave them the loaves, in order that in their hands the astonishing increase might take place and that they might thus be the ministers of Christ's divine power, for as if it had been of small importance that they should be eyewitnesses, Christ determined that his power should be handled by them. Two hundred pence, according to the computation of Budius, are worth about thirty-four French livres, and so when the disciples speak of what is sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little, they calculate at the rate of a farthing for each individual forming so high an estimate of the sum of money that would be required to purchase bread barely sufficient for procuring a morsel to the people, they are entitled to no small praise for their obedience, when they implicitly comply with the command of Christ, and leave the result to his disposal.